for the St. Louis class of cruiser, I will now invoke words most unholy to any engineer who has a shred of personal or professional integrity. Design by committee. Okay, it's okay, you can come out now. The bad words are over. This, hopefully, informs what follows. At the turn of the 20th century, Congress was actually giving the US Navy money to build a few cruisers, a move that was sparked in large part by the Spanish-American War. Following the famous performance of the USS Olympia, the idea began as a revised, and therefore in theory, better version of that particularly powerful ship. Olympia, as covered in her own video, was an especially powerful protected cruiser. Thus, an initial displacement of 6,000 tonnes was decided upon. But soon the changes, or improvements, began to roll in. Sure, the Olympia was tough, but could it be made even tougher with the addition of an armoured belt? Well, yes, but that would mean the ship becomes heavier and it would therefore need to be larger. Well, okay, let's make it larger. Can we make it faster? Yes, but can we make it longer range? Yes. Uh, well, if we took away the 8-inch guns, could we make it even faster? Yet. Yeah. Well, by the time the horror was all over, the final design came in at 9,700 tonnes. As much as other nations' full-scale armoured cruisers, and more than half again as much as Olympia. It was also 82 foot longer, 15 foot wider, and rode 3 foot deeper than the older ship. And at 21,000 shaft horsepower, it had 3,000 more horsepower than Olympia to drive its two screws. The result was that the St. Louis class was almost precisely the same speed as Olympia, uh, the three inch thick deck was only two thirds the thickness of the older ship, and the four turret mounted eight inch guns and ten casement mounted five inch guns had been replaced by fourteen single six inch guns, twelve in broadside casements, and a single gun forward with another aft. The wide scattering of lesser weapons, 18 single 3-inch guns, 12 single 47mm guns, 12 single 37mm guns, a third of them automatic, and two rifle calibre machine guns formed an effective, if eclectic, deterrent to torpedo boats, although the ship itself would carry no torpedoes. The one bright spot of was that the new design carried a 4-inch thick armour belt, the joy at this lasting precisely as long as it took someone to point out that the 7.5, 8-inch, 8.2-inch, and 9.2-inch, as well as other heavy guns on foreign ships of about the same size, would treat such protection as a useful way to guarantee that their shell's fuse is initiated and little else, resulting in the somewhat mocking designation of semi-armoured cruiser in some quarters, whilst the US Navy it themselves quietly filed them under protected cruisers for the purposes of mission profile, at least at the time of their entering service. Three ships would be built, St. Louis, Milwaukee, and Charleston, all of which would be laid down in 1902, launching in 1904 and 1905, and entering service in 1905 and 1906. By 1911, the increases in size and power of torpedo boats led to much of the lesser batteries being removed. Everything smaller than a 3-inch gun was either ditched or turned into a small saluting gun, and in this guise, the three ships would patrol for commerce raiders and take part in convoy escort missions during the First World War, losing most of the remaining 3-inch battery, as well as two of their 6-inch guns, in favour of the obligatory US Navy-issued pair of 3-inch anti-aircraft guns that made up the entirety of most US Navy vessels' anti-aircraft armament until after the conclusion of the war. In 1917, whilst operating off the California coast, Milwaukee was sent to try and tow the submarine H-3 off of a beach, which was where it had grounded the previous year. Unfortunately, all this managed to accomplish was getting Milwaukee grounded as well. Unable to refloat itself, and with the US Navy unwilling to send in yet another ship, she would end up being written off in place. With the advent of the Washington Naval Treaty, the two remaining ships were listed for disposal as new ships came online, and both would be decommissioned in the early 1920s, with St. Louis sold for scrap in 1930, and Charleston likewise sold at the same time, but instead fetching up on the Canadian west coast as a mobile breakwater until she was wrecked in place in 1961, whereupon she was moved to a slightly different location, where she still functions as a stationary breakwater of sorts down to today. 
That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.